Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that I definitely think has not gotten even close to enough coverage. It's kind of disappointing how little I've seen her case be talked about because I definitely think that it's solvable, but it's also one of those cases that has been failed from the very beginning and you'll see why shortly. I wanted to say thank you to Amanda from Patreon for suggesting this case because without you, I wouldn't have known about her case and I wouldn't have known how badly her case needs this attention. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to today's sponsor, NordPass. I've been using NordPass for well over a year at this point and it's made my life so much easier. NordPass is a password security service where security meets simplicity. NordPass is powered by the cybersecurity experts who build NordVPN, the online security app used worldwide. NordPass allows you to store all of your your passwords in one secure place, all of which you can access with one master password. So instead of remembering a million different passwords for every website, you now only have to remember one. NordPass allows you to autofill very secure passwords and it can recognize suspicious websites so you can stay safe while browsing online so you don't accidentally reveal any of your personal information. It can also help you shop online with ease. NordPass can help you create online accounts such as Amazon accounts, create creates a secure and complex password for you so it's impossible for hackers to guess your password. Then it remembers it for you so you don't have to worry about remembering anything yourself. It's super user-friendly, which is amazing because I have a very hard time with learning new technology. NordPass has both desktop and mobile-friendly apps which are not offered by password managers that are pre-installed into your phone. Another cool feature is the data breach scanner. This helps you find out if any of your online information or credit card information has has been leaked. This is so helpful, especially for how many of us shop online. The best part about NordPass is that it's so affordable. You can get an entire month worth for less than the cost of your daily Starbucks coffee. There is a spring forward sale going on right now where my subscribers can get 70% off plus an additional month for free when you go ahead and click the link down below and use code Rachel. It's never been easier and more cost effective to keep all of your passwords and accounts safe, and it can save you a huge headache in the future. Thank you again so much to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's jump right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Stevie Bates. Stevie Danielle Bates was born December 29th, 1992 in Manhattan, New York to her parents Vivian Jones and Stephen Bates. She also had a stepfather named Daryl Jones and had two sisters, Symphony and Nora Bates, as well as two brothers, Darnell Bates and Daryl Jones Jr. Growing up, Stevie lived in the Bronx, New York, and then eventually moved to Bronxville, New York. She went to school at the New York Public Schools in their gifted and talented programs. Then in high school, she attended the Bronx High School of Science and graduated as a National Achievement Scholar, receiving several awards and scholarships for academic excellence. After graduating in 2010, she actually turned down a full scholarship for the University of Arizona and instead went on to study studio art at Hunter College so that she could be closer to home. As you can see, Stevie excelled in pretty much everything she did from the moment that she was born. She was literally a sponge who loved to learn and absolutely absorbed as much information as she could. She was also described as a kind and gentle soul who was shy but outgoing. Her interests spanned over so many different areas including fashion, cooking, decorating, interior design, and music, especially music. Her life was engulfed in music and you could see her at her happiest when she was connecting with dance, art, cinema, or literature. She loved it all. She was the type of person who could make friends with just about anyone and always made it a point to see the best in everyone. She had this way about her where if someone was upset or in a bad mood, her quick wit and jokes could lighten the mood. She was just overall such a sweet and caring person and was absolutely adored by everybody. Now, Stevie seemed to have a pretty great life by all accounts. She excelled in school. Her 
her family absolutely adored her and she had tons of friends. However, soon after graduating high school, she experienced some of the worst trauma that someone can go through. Stevie had actually lost two friends in very close succession to one another. One of her friends died of a drug overdose and the other died by suicide. Naturally, after this, she fell into a bit of a suicide and her mother definitely took notice. There was sort of a shift in her personality, but that was sort of expected from somebody who had just gone through such severe trauma. She went on to bleach her hair and she did grow a little bit distant from her family. Again, this is sort of expected for someone who just lost two people so close together, but her mom was a little bit concerned about her. Now, by September of 2011, Stevie started school at Hunter College. In her political science class, there was a project where she started attending the Occupy Wall Street protests at Zuccotti Park. These protests, in a very short summary, were basically a movement against income inequality. After attending these protests, this movement became so moving to her that she went into full force into joining the movement. She actually set up camp in a tent in Tent City for a month or two before it was ultimately taken down in November of 2011. She was such a passionate person. It's no wonder this movement meant so much to her. A photographer at the Wall Street Journal actually took a picture of her at Tent City after finding out that they were ordered to take it all down. Now, while being involved in these protests, Stevie actually made a new group of friends. One of these friends was a man named Brandon Klosterman. Brandon was from Ohio and he was actually 10 years older than her. At this time, Brandon was actually recovering from a four-year-long heroin addiction and was receiving treatment at the Bellevue Methadone Clinic in Manhattan. Now, despite their age difference, the two got along very well and eventually they started dating. She was often seen hanging out with Brandon and his friends in the city. Now, even though Brandon and all of his friends seem to have problems with sort of breaking law and drug use, there is absolutely no reason to think that Stevie was involved in any of this herself. Those around her said that they did not know her at all to ever be involved in drugs or anything else like that. It was sort of just that she hung out with Brandon and his friends while they got involved in that kind of thing, but she sat out of that. The two seemed to have a pretty decent relationship according to those who knew the both of them, but the two did end up calling it quits in March of 2012. Now, after finishing her first semester at Hunter College, she opted not to enroll in any more courses for the spring semester. Instead, her and three of her friends who she met through protests planned out this road trip to Northern California and they set out in mid-April. I don't know the exact date that they set out. But by April 19th, Stevie called her mother from Virginia, telling her that she had lost her cell phone somewhere. At this point on the road trip, it wasn't exactly clear how far she had gotten on her road trip or if she had ever even made it to California and at this point she was using her friend's cell phone to keep in contact with her mother. Then by April 23rd, Stevie had called her mother once again to let her know that their car had broken down in North Carolina and that she was going to be taking a bus to Arkansas. Then by April 26th, Stevie got onto a Greyhound bus in Hot Springs, Arkansas heading to Manhattan. Then on April 27th, she called her mother once more. This time, she was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on the bus's last layover before she would be arriving in New York. On this phone call, she told her mom that she was due to be home in New York the very next day. But she said that she was actually going to be meeting up with her now ex-boyfriend to go to his house to pick up some of her belongings and that she would be home where they lived in a new house in Yonkers after that. Her mom did offer to pick her up from the Port Authority in New York, but Stevie declined. By April 28th, surveillance video captured Stevie arriving at the Port Authority bus station. She can be seen coming up the escalator, then go over to the next escalator to go up, but turns around and starts walking around in circles. Now, of course, when Stevie hadn't been home by April 29th, Vivian began to worry. She tried getting into contact with Stevie several times, but she just was not answering. So, right away, Vivian called the New York Police Department to report Stevie as missing. But of course, as happens in so many of these disappearances, police did not take it seriously at all. First of all, because Vivian was a resident of Yonkers, not New York City, they said that they could not take the police report right away. 
They also said the classic, well, she's 19 years old, she's allowed to come and go as she pleases. They also said that since she didn't have any proof that Stevie actually even made it to New York City, that she would need to call the New York Port Authority first. However, when she called them, she was redirected to the Pennsylvania Port Authority, who then directed her to Arkansas, where Stevie first boarded the bus towards Manhattan. Once Arkansas verified that she had gotten on the bus, she was redirected back to Pennsylvania, who then directed her to the Pennsylvania Police Department. They then found surveillance video that showed Stevie getting onto the bus back to New York. So once again, she was redirected to the New York Port Authority, who then redirected her to the NYPD. They then redirected her to the Yonkers Police Department, even though she tried making it very clear to them that Stevie lived in New York City. So even though Stevie herself was known to have last been in New York City, Stevie herself lived in New York City because for some reason her mother lived in Yonkers. She wasn't allowed to file a police report with the NYPD. It literally does not make any sense because just before they told her, well, your daughter is an adult, so she can do whatever she wants. But now all of a sudden, because her mom lives in Yonkers, that means that she's no longer an independent an adult. She must be exactly where her mother is for whatever reason. Doesn't even make any sense to me. This entire situation was a complete mess and it made Vivian absolutely frantic because it was obvious that no one wanted the burden of helping her. It was initially reported that Vivian waited until May 9th to report Stevie missing. Now, this is technically true, but what they failed to mention is this entire thing was so back and forth. She tried over and over and over again to report Stevie missing, but she was being directed literally everywhere except for where she went missing. So it was absolutely atrocious. And even after she went missing, police weren't really doing much to help. It wasn't until two weeks after the missing persons report, which was on May 9th, which was still like two or three weeks after she was actually last seen. But two weeks after the missing persons report, the Yonkers police finally made it down to New York City to check surveillance video to see if she did eventually get to New York City which of course we saw that she did. So once they found out that Stevie did in fact go missing in the city of New York, Vivian tried to file a police report with them, but they told her that she couldn't because she already filed with the Yonkers police. So this put the entire investigation at a huge disadvantage because the Yonkers police just did not have access to the same resources that the NYPD did. But even so, they had already missed so many opportunities to search different surveillance videos and track her movement beyond the Port Authority. So the family knew that it was possible that Brandon lived in the Flatbush neighborhood in Brooklyn. Now, I don't don't know if police told them this or if the family just already knew or if they were guessing or what the situation was. But either way, they wanted to go in that direction to start their searches for her. But this was a lot harder than you would think. There are so many different ways to get to Brooklyn via public transportation. Then on top of that, there's no way to even know if she did go to Brooklyn. They're just assuming and hoping. And even if they wanted to go look at all of these different locations, see if they had surveillance video, all that, they couldn't. Because even though a lot of the different train stations and bus stations did have surveillance video, they were erased after 30 days. And by the time the Yonkers police got around to doing absolutely anything, of course, those tapes were gone. Now, I didn't really know where else this fits in the video, so I'm just gonna sort of touch on it here. As I was researching this case, I didn't really see it mentioned anywhere if her friends had been questioned or what they had to say about why she was separated from them. She started this trip with other people, but for some reason, she was seen alone at the bus station. And then nobody even knows where she went after that. So it's really strange to me if her friends weren't able to give absolutely any insight into where she went because it seems like that's a huge reason why this investigation was so difficult. Again, obviously we know that police botched this from the very beginning, but still, what about her friends? Even if the family was able to do their own investigation, what did her friends have to say about any of this? 
I haven't really seen anything again, so I just don't quite know why they got separated or why she was by herself or why her friends don't know where she went after this. That part of this is just so strange to me. But either way, because police weren't really doing anything to help with this investigation, Vivian did as much of the investigation by herself as she could. Now, again, Vivian knew about Brandon and knew that he was a bit of a troubled man. So she started putting up missing persons flyers all around the Bellevue facility. She also started a GoFundMe campaign in order to get her own private investigator, among other things. During their searches, Vivian and her husband, Daryl, had actually run into Brandon at Union Square in New York City. So, of course, they talked to him and asked him whatever they could, but Brandon straight up denied knowing anything about what happened to Stevie or where she was and said that he had no idea that she was planning on coming to visit him on the 28th. He said the last time he saw her was before she left on her road trip. But Vivian was immediately suspicious when Brandon told them this. Vivian had actually gone on Stevie's Facebook and saw that on April 26th, Stevie had exchanged messages with Brandon saying that she was going to be meeting up with him. She had also exchanged messages with her best friend who she had planned on meeting up with during spring break of that year. But then after April 26, there was absolutely no more activity on her Facebook or any of her other social medias. This was very unusual for Stevie because she was pretty active on social media pretty much every single day. She also hadn't called her parents this entire time, which just was not in character for Stevie. Eventually, in late May, police did decide to question Brandon, but it didn't really seem like police were actually actually really interested in considering him for the investigation. Brandon had told police that he hadn't seen or spoken to Stevie since April 19th, but it was found that Brandon had also deleted messages between him and Stevie on his Facebook. Obviously, this is very suspicious, but it's unknown exactly when these messages were deleted. As we know, she was last seen alive on April 28th, and their last conversation was on April 26th, two days before that. So when these messages were deleted, could tell us a lot about how suspicious this actually is. If he deleted them right away, I can see how that may not be totally considered suspicious. It could have been for any number of reasons. Maybe he deleted those messages to try and delete any sign of her in his life because he was still hurt from their breakup. Maybe he was seeing a new girl and he didn't want this new girl to see that he was still in contact with his ex. So I'm not saying for sure that it could be these reasons. I'm not saying that it's not suspicious, but I'm just trying to give credit to both sides. Because I know in a lot of situations, people jump to things like this as being very suspicious suspicious, but I'm just trying to give credit where credit is due. But either way, after the police's interview with Brandon, they came out and confidently said that Brandon Klosterman is not a person of interest in this case. After this, Brandon sort of went off the grid. He no longer hung around the spots that he used to. He hadn't even reached out to Stevie's parents to offer his help or help the investigation in any way. For the next several years, Stevie's family continued desperately searching for their bright, beautiful daughter, but they had no luck. Then, in March of 2013, badly decomposed skeletal remains were found in a charred suitcase in a burnt-out building in the bedford Stuvie stand neighborhood of Brooklyn, not far from Brandon's apartment. Now, again, Stevie's family thought that it was possible that Stevie was heading to Brooklyn. In addition to this, the remains came back as belonging to an African-American young woman. They also did a facial reconstruction, which looked strikingly similar to Stevie. The estimated time of death of this person was also very close to when we know Stevie disappeared. However, after further investigation, these remains did not end up belonging to Stevie, but belonged to another female victim who went missing from Kansas. But at this point, so many questions remained. Where did Stevie go after the bus station? Did she head towards Brooklyn? And did she ever make it to Brooklyn? We have absolutely no idea what happened after she was last seen at the New York Port Authority. Then in September 2020, almost nine years after Stevie went missing, human remains had been found at a construction site of a home that was being demolished in Glendale, Queens, which is right on the border between Queens and Brooklyn. In a bank about five feet deep into the ground, the excavator pulled up a rolled up blanket and the construction worker noticed that something was falling out of the blanket. In the rolled up blanket, they discovered a human femur, mandible, and a skull. It was clear to them that these remains had been there for quite some time and after further investigation, 
These remains were confirmed as belonging to Stevie Bates. So after this horrible, gruesome discovery, Stevie's parents could no longer hold out hope that maybe she was just out there somewhere. Someone took her life from her, but that's all they really know. We don't know when or how, and we don't know who's responsible. So of course, there are a few theories as to what may have happened. And with these theories, they sort of bring up a couple of questions that have been running through my head. So of course, the first most obvious theory is that Stevie's ex-boyfriend, Brandon, is somehow involved. We know that she was supposed to meet up with him on the very same day that she disappeared. We know that he had deleted messages between the two of them. We know that he was not involved in the investigation whatsoever. I will also note that he didn't attend Stevie's funeral after she went missing or after she was identified. He never reached out to the family to give his condolences and never once checked in on the investigation for the entire nine years that she was missing. Then lastly, we know that he was involved with drugs and had somewhat of a criminal history, which involved possession, trespassing, public intoxication, and other things like that. I just think that it's so strange that he didn't bother to check in on her or where the investigation was was going even once after she went missing. To me, this is the biggest thing that makes him look very suspicious. Sure, the two didn't date for super long, but they still dated and he claimed to have cared about her while they were dating. I feel like even if I had broke up with someone and then they went missing, I would be concerned about their disappearance because even if we had a horrible breakup and I was still really hurt, this is still someone who you once cared about and you have no idea what happened to them or if they're okay. Most people would do whatever they could to help even if they were exes, even if they were still hurt, you'd have to be a pretty low person to wish them harm and not want to help at all just because they hurt you. Whether it be sharing some places that they were known to frequent because you know that person well enough to know where they spent their time or any problems that they may have been facing while you guys were dating or any friends that she had who you could go question or anything like that. Literally anything helps in an investigation, but he didn't do anything. So to me, that says that he either already knew exactly what happened to her, or he was just such a scumbag that he just didn't care, or that he was too busy being involved in his substance use that he just simply wasn't really thinking about it. Or the other thing that does pop into my head is that maybe because of his substance use, he didn't want to ask police or be involved in police whatsoever because he was afraid of that. But either way, I do think it's weird that not even once he checked in on anything. But with all of that being said, a pretty big theme in this case is the fact that Brandon and his friends were all involved with drugs. I've seen a lot of people point to this being the reason why Brandon is involved. However, I will say that being involved in drugs in and of itself does not make someone inherently violent. In fact, those who use are more likely to be victim of a violent crime than being the ones who are committing them. Brandon also did not have a violent criminal background. Yes, he had broken the law, but he had never done anything violent. Now, am I saying that this means he wasn't involved? Absolutely not. But I do not think it's fair to point to someone's drug use as the sole reason for them harming somebody. So I am just trying to be fair of my analysis of the entire situation. So with that being said, if we do consider Brandon a suspect, which I kind of do, Let's talk about what could have happened. So it's possible that she did end up meeting Brandon just like she said she would. Maybe Brandon met up with her with the expectation that the two were going to get back together, but was disappointed when Stevie showed up only wanting to grab her belongings and go home. Maybe they got into some sort of fight because he, again, was expecting something different. Maybe he asked her for one last sexual encounter and she turned him down. Maybe any of these things could have made him angry enough to harm her, or maybe he he had planned on taking her life, so he got her to meet up with him at his house so that he could harm her there. Now, when it comes to this theory and knowing where she was found, I do have a couple of questions. Was this house fully built when her body was buried there, or was it under construction? 
Was it abandoned? Was it being built? I tried finding more information about this house and trust me, I dug, but I just could not find it. If anyone knows more about the status of this house in 2012, please let me know. But knowing that information can tell us a lot about how she may have ended up there. I also want to mention that Brandon was squatting at an apartment. He was kind of bouncing from one place to another. He never actually signed a lease to live anywhere or anything like that. So he was kind of hard to track. So this makes me wonder, was he squatting in this house at that time? Did he know the people who lived there? I also don't know if she was buried under the house itself or in the yard or under the driveway. All of that information has yet to come out. Honestly, all of the articles that I found about her remains being missing have been very vague and haven't given much detail at all. And even then, I haven't seen many articles about it anyways. I think I found as many as three or four articles all saying the exact same thing. So again, we don't really know. I do know that this house was abandoned at the time of her being found, but that's nine years later. That's a long time. And I have no idea if that house was actually abandoned for that long. But either way, the main theory is that Brandon had something to do with her death. Yes, police had ruled her out, but this is just such a strange coincidence that she just happened to tell her mom that she's going to see him. And then the very next day, she's just gone. Now, even though the drugs may not have been exactly what made him harm her, it's possible that if he was taking enough drugs, he may not have known what happened. If he had killed someone that he cared about, he could have used drugs to cope and get it out of his memory. Or he could have been on drugs at the time that this happened, so he just genuinely doesn't remember. The reason that I bring this up is because police read body language when interrogating suspects, which is kind of normally how they can tell if someone is guilty or not just by interviewing them. If Brandon showed absolutely no body language cues that he was lying, police may have just been very convinced that he was telling telling the truth and just ruled him out. Or maybe he just gave police a false alibi and got other people to lie about his alibi. So police saw, hey, this guy has an alibi. It checks out. So that's why they ruled him out. At the end of the day, we know that police botched this investigation from the very beginning. And it absolutely would not surprise me if they falsely ruled someone out while they were at it. The other theory when it comes to Brandon possibly being responsible is that maybe the two had met up at this abandoned house for one reason or another. And she fell and hurt herself and died that way. If this was an abandoned house at the time and it was a construction site and they were just trespassing for fun that day, it's possible that she could have gotten herself hurt. Then maybe Brandon was on drugs at the time or maybe not, but either way, maybe he decided to bury her body because he didn't want to be blamed. Maybe he didn't want to be caught with drugs. Any of those things are totally possible. At the end of the day, I could totally see Brandon just not wanting to be involved with police whatsoever, so he covers whatever tracks he can because if he is in this murder investigation and police are looking at him very closely, he could think like, hey, this technically wasn't my fault, but they might catch me with drugs. So I just don't want them to know that this entire thing happened in the first place. I don't want them snooping around my house. I don't want them snooping around my life. I don't want them finding these drugs. I don't want them finding them in my system. Any of those possible things can be going through his head. The other theory is that a serial killer is responsible. I did look through a Reddit thread and did a little bit of research on different serial killers that kill teenage women in Brooklyn. One man was named Krohuru Govan. I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I, I practiced. I don't think I'm saying it right though, but um, he did kill a 17-year-old girl in 2004 in Bushwick, Brooklyn, which is very close to where Stevie was found but this man was not apprehended until 2016. So it's possible that throughout that entire decade, he didn't stop killing. This young woman whose name was Shara Bria Thomas, again, I'm so sorry if I'm saying her name wrong, but she was sexually assaulted and strangled and showed signs of blunt force trauma to her head and torso. She was found dumped in an alley with her body stuffed in laundry bags. Then after this murder, he went on to kill another 19-year-old named Rashawn Brazel in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn. This time he dismantled her body, put her body parts in trash bags, and put them into a subway station recycling plant. Police have found possible connections between him and numerous unsolved murders in California, New York, and Florida, which is where he was living when he was apprehended in 2016.
2018. So it's not known exactly where he was in 2012 or how many people he may have actually killed. But this entire thing is very weird and it definitely could be connected to Stevie, especially because we don't know Stevie's cause of death. We don't know if her cause of death matches this guy's MO or if it was completely different. Now, the biggest thing pointing away from this theory is the fact that her body was found wrapped in a blanket. This man clearly did not give a damn about any of his victims. We know that because he literally put them into trash bags and just dumped them. That shows a lot about what he felt for his victims. He literally thought that they were trash. But Stevie was wrapped in a blanket. That shows that whoever killed her had at least some compassion for her, if you can call it that. Basically what I'm saying is this person seemed to have at least felt a little bit bad. He didn't want her to be cold and uncomfortable. He wanted her body to be covered and not exposed. So that shows a lot more of a personal connection to the victim in my opinion and based off of what we've seen in other cases. So that aspect of this does point to Brandon. I guess we could also consider that maybe it was one of Brandon's friends who had harmed her. Maybe it was someone who she had met at the protest who didn't agree with her political views enough to want to harm her. Maybe it was a random stalker. Maybe it was one of the people she was on the road trip with or one of her other friends. I haven't really seen this mentioned anywhere and I don't want to put the blame on anybody unjustly, but I just wanted to throw that out there. We really can't be sure who is responsible. All we know is that she definitely was murdered and whoever did it is walking free or at the very least, they haven't faced any consequences for Stevie's murder. At the end of the day, Stevie was a bright, beautiful young woman with absolutely so much life to live ahead of her. She was so intelligent and passionate about the things that she believed in. She did seem to get involved in the wrong people who just were not good for her. People whose lifestyles were completely different from her, but that is so common for so many people her age. She had been excelling in school and had been straight edge her entire life. But then she found this cause that she just cared so much about and met other people who had the same beliefs as her. It's just natural that she would want to gravitate towards people who believed in the same things as her and were passionate about the same things as her. It's another case where I absolutely do not want to hear anything negative about Stevie because she is the victim here. All she was trying to do was find herself in a massive city with so many millions of people. She had a whole world around her that she was just trying to go out and experience and someone took advantage of her along the way. I don't really know what I think happened to Stevie, but I do lean more towards Brandon knowing a little bit more or a lot more than what he's letting on. I am very disappointed in how little coverage her case has gotten. Like I said, there wasn't very many articles about her case in general and unfortunately that is all too common in cases that involve black men and women. There their cases just are not reported on as much as white people's cases are and that is a fact. So hopefully more information comes out about her case in the coming months. I'm just hoping that police are still investigating and the reason that we don't know a lot of information is because they're just being tight-lipped. But even then, I don't even know if I trust that they're doing anything. From the beginning, they pushed her disappearance to the side and nobody wanted to take any responsibility for investigating. I'm just afraid that they found her remains and were like, okay, Okay, we know that she's not missing anymore, so let's just focus on something else. I don't know, it just worries me how little her case has been reported on, especially when her remains were found. That is huge news to only have four articles about. It's absolutely crazy. So let's show her family that there are people who still care about Stevie and just want to see justice be served. There are people out there who are still sharing her story and want to make sure that somebody is held accountable for taking the life of such a beautiful and talented young woman. The world lost somebody amazing and I can't even imagine what her life would be like now or what she would have gone on to accomplish had someone not taken advantage of her. So that is where I'm going to end today's video and now 
now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think Brandon is responsible or do you think something else is at play? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send me an email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!